the last session of today in this big data track, we have the venture capitalists coming in and they will talk about where the investments have been, where they are doing investments in this space today, and where they'll be doing in the future. So another aspect of the future from the venture capitalists. So please welcome Alok Mahajan, KPMG partner. He will be introducing the rest of his panel. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for being here this Friday afternoon. It's a power-packed panel and uh, should be very insightful. We only have half an hour, so we'll probably dive right, in, right into it. We won't go into detail intros. You have the bios. Um, again, Rohini from NEA, uh, Atif uh, from Lightspeed, Dharmesh from Intel Capital, and Simon from Clearstone have done great transactions. So let's get started. First question I'm going to ask them is just, what have they done in recent past, which could be in purview of uh, big data? Uh, what kind of transactions, to the extent they can share how they're panning out? Um, and uh, today happens to be a very interesting day for big data, where big data meets finance, because it's Facebook's IPO anniversary, uh, depending on how you see it. And also, one of Rohini's portfolio company, or NEA company, went public, big data. So, so that probably calls for an applause. And, with that, I'll ask Rohini to go. Uh, or someone, you can, we can start from there and then work over. You have the microphone. Yeah. What am I saying? <laughs> it's um, it's a question was, um, what have you done in the past that you, and, and you know, looking back. Uh, what, around big data? Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a confusing question because. The definition. The definitions are very nebulous. I think the word big data is, is very much in people's vernacular today, but it's not something. It's not something new for at least for us as we've been looking at companies doing stuff at scale because there hasn't been a choice but to use what today is known as big data technology to build anything on scale. So my exposure, I think, to big data started with the world of advertising technologies. There's a company called Rubicon Project that we incubated that is um, built on top of a big data technology stack doing, I think, Last I heard, 40 billion transactions a day, so that's a lot of data that they have to figure out what to do with. It's built on top of MapR's technology, which is a big data technology company. So I think there's two distinct markets, at least for me, when I think of big data. It's the guys building technologies that are being hardened and being used that allow you to use big data, and then there are the guys building applications or products on top of these platforms. And my focus has always been more on the applications and product side. So that was one company. Cetus is another one that we had done a few years ago, a couple of years ago, that was doing analytics in the cloud. And before it could launch a product, we sold it to VMware. Uh, but it's doing well there. And, and in such, now we have a big data holding incubator company called The Hive, which has started five new projects in the last six months. But what we did there was we built our own big data stack. So all the companies who knew the application world didn't, go out, didn't have to go out and build their own teams for the understanding how to use the big data stack. So a lot of exposure. I think it's a very strong trend. A lot of technology companies are going to have to use these technologies. Understanding this is very important in our business. And it's great to see validation and great to see an IPO around this trend. It, it's great for all of us. Uh, hopefully, we'll see more. OK. Great. Dharmesh? Sure. I think you might. Sorry, <laughs> oh. that work. You can have another one. That's okay. Mm -hmm. One's good enough. Uh, so again, for for Intel Capital, where I focus uh, on big data investments, I think this area is doubly important because, on one hand, it represents a good investment opportunity from a financial return perspective, but also for Intel, it represents an opportunity to create net new compute cycles. You know, create the next 10 billion in in server revenue or CPU cycle revenue, if you will. So it's it's pretty important to us. Now, two years ago, when I uh, started to look at the area. The focus, you know, just like a lot of technologists, was bottoms up. Let's look at components. Let's look at Hadoop and the like. Uh, but in, in talking to a number of CIOs, you know, I, I'm fortunate to run the CIO advisory council for Intel Capital as well. A lot of the people were saying, you know, this whole big data thing. Uh, our analytics solutions were based on asking the questions we know faster. This big data thing represents new ways of asking new questions, and we don't quite know what questions we want to ask. So I think we, we kind of focused a couple of years ago on kind of packet solutions that allowed 
companies in certain verticals to, to get this whole full suite of big data solutions. So for example, I have a company called Guavas Analytics. Uh, they're used by every mobile carrier, whether it's AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, uh, and a number of others overseas. We're trying to figure out, I got, you know, Verizon's got 15 billion data points every day about users on the mobile network, and they want to be able to use the whole stack to figure out which one's going to stress my network, which user has the most uh, 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 risk of falling off a network. And so they take a vertical approach, and we invested there in the B round and seen the company grow nicely year over year. Uh, another example is a company called Enlighted, which we started out as an energy management solution. But increasingly, when they put their sensors in buildings, they're collecting a ton of data about buildings, and they're helping commercial building owners use big data technologies like Hadoop and Mongo and others uh, make sense out of their, their building maintenance and reduce their costs. So that was the thesis two years ago. Last year, as the industry has matured a lot more, uh, we've seen kind of Web 2.0, financial services, and the like, the more savvy, the tech-savvy companies start to assemble solutions around components. So we kind of shifted our focus a lot more to infrastructure components and big data as that ecosystem matures. So we have a company uh, called Tengen, which has a popular NoSQL platform called MongoDB, uh, which is used by a number of companies for operational intelligence. Uh, also have another company called Mirantis that does a lot of big data applications on OpenStack cloud infrastructure. So kind of you know, uh, a top-down vertical solutions as well as more recently, infrastructure solutions and components is uh, what we've been looking at. Excellent. Atif? So, uh, you know, at Lightspeed, we've been, we're, we're primarily early stage investors, and we've been looking at the world of uh, what traditionally is we call business intelligence going back to the late 90s when we invested in a company called Informatica. Now, fa fast forward about a decade later when Hadoop was just starting to get crystallized as, a, as, a, as an open source project that had a lot of momentum we started looking thematically once again at the world of business intelligence. This was well before the word big data really existed. So in 2009, we started thinking about what Hadoop and NoSQL type technologies could really do to disrupt the business intelligence infrastructure and, and uh, application stack. And so we started thematically by investing at the infrastructure layer, at the bottommost layer, with our investment in MapR. I think you, you heard from Srivas uh, in the panel before. That was uh, circa 2009 when it was, it was really incubated as an enterprise class Hadoop solution. Fast forward about six to nine months later, we, we invested in a company called Datastax. So while MapR really focused at, the point, at that point in time on the analytics OLAP uh, piece of the stack, Datastax was more focused around the Cassandra project and, and dealing with transactional data, OLTP. Um, those were our two foundational infrastructure investments. We then started looking at, well, as these in pieces of infrastructure become more prevalent in enterprises, what does that mean from an application perspective? So now that you can actually store a bunch of data, deal with a large volume of data, and analyze varieties of data, what are the new types of applications that you can then build on top of these hardening platforms that are, that are making their way into the enterprise? And so as a result, we invested in EdgeSpring, which actually came out of stealth yesterday. Uh, uh, that was circa 2010. EdgeSpring builds uh, a, a, a complete stack optimized for mobile. It's essentially, to a certain extent, next generation Tableau or next generation ClickTech. It's, it's real-time exploratory data application directed at a business user. What is happening in my company right now at this point in time? We also invested in a company called Cubol. Cubol is uh, a big data stack that's built in the cloud. The founders were most recently at Facebook where they built the big data stack at Facebook and actually invented Hive, which is a SQL layer on top of, uh, on top of Hadoop. Uh, we announced our Series A investment uh, a couple of months ago, but we actually seeded them two years ago. Ashish and Joydeep are, are phenomenal technologists and uh, are building a, a cloud-based data analytics platform. And then another application, which is probably a little further afield from pure business intelligence is Boundary. Boundary actually targets the IT manager, um, the, the network operator, the storage operator, um, who really needs to figure out what is happening inside the data center. And so um, with, the, with the idea that you could actually store an insane amount of data and analyze that data in real time, what sort of dashboards and real time analysis could you actually create for an IT manager um, from a cloud-based big data solution? And then more on the consumer side, we invest in a company called Zestcash. Zestcash uh, uses thousands 
of pieces of data for an individual to come up with a, with a new type of credit score to figure out if that person actually sh is credit worthy and what, the cre and, and what sort of risk a bank or actually an online lender should actually target for that, for that lender, so for, for that user. So you know, from, a, from an investment perspective, we started at the infrastructure layer and then we've been investing thematically and systematically at the application layer. Really? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, so a lot of interesting investments there. So I guess um, just to give you a history, a little bit of a history on where NEA has been, um, and obviously this is a 30-year-old firm, and I've been at NEA since about 2007. But the company that just went public today was invested in 2004. So they went public with the symbol data today. So, it, you know, I think they were uh, an investment we made before big data was coined, and uh, to Suman's point, there have been a lot of iterations of this. Um, in the most recent instantiation, I think uh, the few companies that might be interesting is, or actually, let me just take a step back and say there are probably two sorts of companies we're investing in. One is um, using uh, data and analytics in order to enable a new business model. So, you know, like Zestcash, we are, we are an investor in a company called Zoom. Which is uh, which a lot of you might be familiar with, which is remittances, international remittances, um, and if you start going down further in the infrastructure, you actually take uh, pieces of uh, technology that have been proven to enable new business models, whether they're in retail or finance. Have systems companies as well that are very much active or in adjacent spaces like storage and so on. So pretty uh, large set of investments from us. We have about uh, 15 or so investments in the big data space that are active today and we're looking at new ones every day. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, and just to give you a perspective, I think um, last year in 2012, again, just like Suman said, there's some definitional issue with big data, uh, but going by general definition, uh, it, roughly about 1.3 billion in venture capital went into big data investment in 2012. Uh, it spread over about 160 investment. Uh, about half a billion of that was just in Q4 alone. And there were 20 exits, including three IPO. I, I was assume one was a Splunk, which was well known. Um, so th that was sort of a little bit of a backward look. I would like my panelists, I would request that now we sort of shift gears and, and, and look forward a little bit uh, where they're focusing. Uh, we heard a variety of discussions this morning. Um, in the morning uh, from Intel discussion, which was a little more focused on infrastructure. It went to visualization, et cetera, so complete kind of spectrum. And I would like to know if they are seeing that this kind of walk from infrastructure more towards app and analytics, as well as what's your personal sense of where we are in this cycle? Um, going back, do you, do you see it closer to you know, Netscape to web van? Mm -hmm. That was kind of phase one, uh, or uh, rather end of the beginning, right? Uh, so where do, where do you see this whole um, theme in life cycle. So, Sumant, let me start with you again. Um, I think it depends on who you ask. I think everyone has a different point of view, which is why we are all in different funds, doing different things. Um, I think there is, I think we're very early in trying to figure out how to use these new technologies to enable things people do, or value that can be bought into a process to make it more efficient or value that can be bought into a piece of technology that makes better decisions. So um, I'm actually very excited about what's available now. I think there are things we haven't thought of that are going to have a big component of what they're going to be is the ability to use stuff that they never could before. So data that's just lying around or gets wasted. I think there are applications, and I'll give you a point, uh, uh, not, unfortunately not in my portfolio, but a company like Uber, I don't think it's a big data company, but it is using data that could never be accessed before to make better intelligent, sort of efficient use of unused uh, time in, in cars, and I'm sure there's going to be more of that kind of stuff. So I think the concept of big data or the, or like I said, for me, the challenge always is to say, is this a big data company? Because every one of my portfolio companies suddenly thinks that they are. <laughs> um, you know, I said, what are you talking about? Yesterday you were selling cars, today you're a big data company. You know, that's what the uh, next stage investor wants to buy, so I'm going to change my name. That's <laughs> going to play out, and there's no longer, no one talks about a database company or something like that. Every company is going to have some component of this and going to morph it and use it. 
But you know, I, I have to give credit to the technology companies in the Bay Area that have actually created this. So you know, <laughs> Yahoo and Google and, and LinkedIn, yeah. Facebook to a certain degree, Twitter have pushed the boundaries of what now is open source and other companies can use. So this stuff sitting around will create for a new wave of innovation. That's fantastic for people like us to be part of, to enable, and to see which ones grow and become successful companies. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, so I, a lot along the lines of what Suman just said, but I think put it slightly differently, I think there's a lot of work that is being done today in making existing businesses better. So you know, Arif talked about an example of improving credit score, or you know, I talked about Verizon trying to get a better sense of their customer retention or better pushing uh, the envelope on keeping customers happy. I think that's, that's going to take some time, but I think the most exciting part perhaps of big data is the net new business models that will be possible. I mean, there's a ton of data from your mobile phones or from the internet of things as people call it, whatever that means, but a bunch of network devices which throw out a bunch of data and is it possible to create a net new business out of it? You know, so I think if you knew all the answers, and I don't think there would uh, be a need for venture capital, frankly. But I think there's a lot of these exciting ideas which we can't think of today, net new business models that will go beyond making existing industries, existing enterprises efficient. And so I think along those lines, we are still at the very beginning stages of this whole big data phenomenon. Uh, what it, <clears throat> excuse me. What excites me most is as the infrastructure is being hardened and the cost of storing and analyzing data has gone to zero and the time to an answer has been reduced. The set of applications that are available not only on the enterprise side but on the consumer side are, are they're, they're infinite to a certain extent, right? I mean, if, if you can ask, the way that you can ask a question on Google and get an answer in .0025 seconds in the enterprise, the amount of business agility, revenue growth, cost reduction that you can do based on big data technologies is, is incredible. And so I think these, this new set of technologies opens up a field of, of new applications that target business line uh, people, such as product managers, such as data scientists, such as marketing managers, such as VP sales. I mean, there, if you go department by department within the enterprise, there, there's a whole new set of applications that will be invented over the next three to five years that will make those people's lives a lot easier because those people no longer have to get access to a limited set of resources which used to be the data warehouse. On the consumer side, uh, we've seen it in ad tech companies, we've seen it in mobile companies, the amount, we've seen it in Internet of Things companies. The amount of data being generated is, is, is an incredible amount of data and it's up to you, the entrepreneurs, to really figure out what to do with it and come up with some amazing business models. Where are we in the hype cycle? Um, well, last year, big data was declared the word of the year. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that, along, that yeah. sort of says we're at the peak. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll come up with new terminology uh, over the next couple of years. So, yeah. So I guess you know, a lot of this has been said. I, um, I would say I'd put uh, new investments in two buckets. One is really around customer delight, so things that you wouldn't expect, um, that if you just had this all put together in a new way, how, you know, how would you accept it? And this could be as far as, you know, if you look at the sources of data, there are obviously da uh, data sources that are the open public um, things that you can mash up in the, uh, and deliver new services. It could be government data. There is a ton of government data out there and a lot of entrepreneurs who are sort of looking at how do you bring that together um, in, in order to provide new experiences in sort of in the public-ish sphere. sphere. Um, and then, of course, in the second bucket, you, you, you have all of the um, known business models, people who have come out, uh, Amazon has come out and re-innovated uh, retail. They've put a retail business model around essentially a big data play, but there are tons and tons of good retailers out there who need the same sorts of technologies in order to uh, match that level of experience. So the enterprise sale is really wrapped around where the puck has moved in terms of what people expect um, from the people that they're, they're dealing with. Um, and just a broad area where I think there's, there's going to be a lot of new investments is all things real time. So um, I just made an investment in a company called Kazing, which does um, real time web communication. So there's a whole um, re-architecting going on, just even in the uh, web communication space, that's pretty interesting. Um, and then the streaming interactions are, are where I think things are looking very interesting, whether they are, they're calling them in Internet of Things. Um, 
but essentially real-time decision making. So the real time, whether it is to provide the new experience or whether it is to actually um, be present for a transaction faster than your competitor. So the, the puck is again moving on what's considered real time and, and we're seeing a lot of new companies come around to enable those, um, those experiences. Okay, thank you. And I'm looking at the time, and we don't have too much yeah. uh, time left, so we'll, we'll get a uh, little bit uh, focused. Is there, if um, someone approached you with an idea or a business plan, is there one vertical, and, and when I read about it or listen about this whole space, what intrigues me is that it cuts across many, many verticals. You yeah. talk retail, you talk automotive, you talk healthcare. It cuts across the entire um, economy. Um, when I was listening to Courier, the, one of the co-authors of Big Data Book, uh, with, along with Oxford Professor, they highlighted, I believe, three sectors, uh, automotive, healthcare, one more was, I believe, education. I couldn't relate to all of those. So, Suman, let me just uh, go with you, because you've done a lot of broad things, from gaming to build to infrastructure. So, just your take well, on you, what you would find most fundable. For anybody here who has an interest in starting a company, if you ever come to a VC today and say we're a big data company, you won't get funded. And essentially, I think next year you'll be thrown out of the office because anything <laughs> that has so much hype has to come down, right? No one funds a social company anymore. Right. Everything is inherently social. So having said that, I think where, we are, where I'm spending time, where we are spending time is in a lot of the stuff everyone has talked about, but specifically there is a project I'm pretty excited about around hardening machine-to-machine -machine communication or data coming out of that and using it to create a security layer in now what is the internet that has no perimeter. That's a big data problem, because there is no way, there is no, there is no wall that you have to break through. Everything is nebulous and everything. And the only way to do that is to recognize patterns in data. That's a big data problem. And so specifically, I think mobile is an amazing area, because there's just so much data that's being generated and in such high volume and velocity that without sort of reinventing some of these existing technologies, it's hard to even know what the next step is. I don't think there's enough out there to even um, efficiently sort of say, I can use stuff <laughs> off the rack or open source and make it work. So there's a lot of creativity involved. There's a lot of innovation involved. And all of those are the things that at least excite our community and make for interesting investment proposals. So we, like I said, we have about five or six new projects we've done over the last six months that are, quote, unquote, in the big data space. Mm -hmm. Um, if I start telling you about all of them, then I'm sort of letting the cat out of the bag too early. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it's, uh, I can't say I have a favorite vertical per se, but I think in general, when we look for verticals that have the most amount of data, net new data, that have the most amount of disruption, that is, you know, uh, it's uh, very likely to happen. Uh, and who could benefit from it? I mean, you know, the usual vertical, so, you know, carriers, mobile carriers, have got a ton of data to worry about from the infrastructure standpoint. Uh, you got retail that has a lot of data about position that they can mine for better, uh, better customer targeting. You've got healthcare and education. Now each of these kind of bring in its own set of tactical challenges when it comes to sales models. I mean, when you think about selling to the government, I mean, most startups we don't start the business selling to the government, but there's companies like Palantir that have figured out a great way to penetrate that. So I think there's a number of these verticals that have a lot of data that are ripe for change. Some that are named, but. Each of them has a set of you know, go-to-market and sales challenges that need some innovative models. So those are the verticals that we, we tend to focus on. I think that gives us enough okay. of perspective. And so what we'll do is uh, we can actually, um, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, barely a minute. So we'll move towards the closing <laughs> statement. Um, and uh, one thing I noticed, for example, just three days back, there was a company out of Oregon which was bought by Twitter. It was visualization, right? So it was funded only by, I think, 500K and, and there are a couple of data science set, but they came up with something useful, like, like you were saying. It's not about big data, it's about utility. It's, it's interesting if you can create a company in, in that amount of capital, that kind of time. Um, I don't know what you see going out there, but I'll, if you could combine that with your closing statement, anything you want to tell your audience, what's, um, and we'll just um, make the best of remaining time. Bhavani, we'll reverse the order. To totally. Um, <laughs> So I would say, you know, in, in terms of um, the new opportunities, obviously um, there's a whole bunch of re-architecting going on in various spaces. So you should be, as entrepreneurs, you should be out there looking for new ideas, and we look for your lead in, telling, in leading us to these new spaces. Um, 
early is, is great. Like I uh, said before, our investment in Tableau was in 2004, right? So, you know, as a firm, we like early stage investments, um, including seed stage investments, and we love to look at new ideas starting from scratch, but we're also doing a lot of um, growth stage investing as well um, around what people sort of um, facetiously call the lazy developer model, but uh, you know, where you have services that are being delivered so that developers can be more productive. So all of those things are fair game and you know, certainly a very nice uh, active investing area. So I'd encourage all of you to think hard about that. Thank you. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll just say a few things. One, uh, think about what happens when the world goes real time. I think there's a ton of opportunity over there. Two, uh, predictive analytics. We didn't talk a lot about this on this, on this panel, but what happens if, you can, if, the, if the technology can surface insights to a user? I think that's, I'm, I'm Canadian, and I love the analogy of where the puck is going to go. I think that's where the puck is going, the combination of real time plus predictive analytics. Uh, and finally, you know, don't, don't necessarily focus just on a vertical, but try to build something that is horizontal, that can touch people across all industries. I think that's the reason companies like Tableau, ClickTech, Splunk have, have been so successful, is because they didn't necessarily start with just a vertical focus, they were horizontally applicable with solutions for verticals, right? They had to tailor their, their solutions to specific verticals. Um, and the last thing I have to do is, is put in a plug for Lightspeed. We're, we're early stage investors. Come talk to us. We'd love to hear about your ideas and potentially partner with you. I'll just quickly uh, comment out. I agree with Arif completely. The, where the puck's going to be is, again, to take in analytics to the next level in terms of real time, predictive, and the like. I agree with that. I guess one general comment I'll make uh, is a lot of us in Silicon Valley, a lot of your entrepreneurs, you know, we, we get fascinated by technology and building great components, but I think there's a world outside of Silicon Valley. There's a lot of buyers out there, enterprise customers. And so when you build companies, think about how you're going to help your customers get into new lines of business and increase their top line rather than just optimizing the infrastructure and some component of it. Because I'll tell you, customers are more likely to to you know, go with the solution if you can help them expand their business as opposed to kind of streamline their operations. So let's keep that in mind as we're building companies. A closing statement. Um, if I knew exactly what, I would probably be starting a company, not looking for the <laughs> investment. But having said that, this is an amazing new area of technology, and there is a real dearth of talent, people who actually know how to manipulate it and are creative enough to use it effectively. Um, every one of our companies is trying to find people who can get engaged in board. And if I have, very, this is my intuition, I don't have any numbers, but I would say that, that today, big data services is probably a much, much bigger market than big data products or big data platforms or whatever you want to call Sorry. it, the technology itself. Because people don't know what to do with it. So it's just starting. I think there's a lot to be done. Getting engaged and involved is more important. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking my panelists. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Let's give them a big hand.